Well, happy Sunday, everybody. I want to welcome you guys to worship service this morning. Thank you to those of you that are here in person and everybody joining us online. I want to invite you to worship God with us. We're going to spend a few time, a few minutes lifting God's name high and then hear from Pastor Calvin. It's going to be a good morning.
give up our hearts to you, Jesus, this morning. There's nothing else that we have that we owe that we could give to you, Lord. And in response to this love that we don't deserve for the redemption of our sins, Lord, for the forgiveness that we have in you, Lord. We just don't deserve those things, Lord. And in response to your love, Jesus, we just offer our lives and our hearts as a living sacrifice to you, Lord. surrender our lives again and again, Lord. We worship you this morning. We thank you for your presence amongst us. We give you praise because you're the only one that deserves that praise, Lord. And we glorify you forever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah. Will you give him one more shout of praise? He deserves that. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, good morning and welcome once again. And welcome to those watching us online. Well, let's just take a moment and just wave to each other and greet each other. Shaka. Yeah, awesome. Well, help me welcome Adam on stage. Here we go. Good morning, New Hope. Good morning. I promise I won't, I won't cry this week because uh, it won't be as long of a talk. So uh, this is just announcements. So uh, Cow Cow for Keiki, uh, we're in our third week um, out of six, and we got some pictures of just volunteers up here. This is more just a celebration than it is an announcement for volunteers because we've been blessed with, with plenty of volunteers. What we do is we pick things up in the morning, um, 84 kits for distribution at New Hope here, and then 91 uh, for Kama'ana Hale, and it's, it's really a lot of food, so we're doing that in the morning, and then we get to give it out um, in the evening, and it's, it's just a blessing to be there hanging out with, with just other people who are serving um, our community, as well as just to meet people from the community, so we just want to thank all our volunteers um, again for that, and we have a few more weeks, so we're excited for that. The next one is, um, next announcement is men's group. Our once a month men's group we have this month is gonna be July 2nd. Again down, I think the past three or four times we've had it at Pine Trees at 5 p.m. So you just come there and we hang out and uh, we barbecue, we eat food and we just have fun. So if you haven't done it, please come. If you have, come again, um, July 2nd. So that's this upcoming Friday. Then the last one, the last announcement is Ohana groups. We're we're going to be launching them sometime in August, probably around mid-August. So this is kind of the first announcement to, to gain some interest around this. I have some sign-up sheets out in the Ohana room that are more just signing up to say that you're interested in joining a Ohana, Ohana group. You might be interested in leading one as well, but I'll contact you. You can also um, email me as well if you don't want to sign up on that sheet. Um, Ohana groups are... They're a super important way and a super good way to get connected with other people in the church to actually live life with instead of just coming and listening to it. Worshiping you know, together is very important. Listening to the word is very important, all of those things. But actually living life with people and struggling through things together, um, I think is the most powerful thing. And it has been, you know, in Bree and my life, we, we've been in several Ohana groups and um, and continue to have connections with those people, right? So this, the design of these will be more every two weeks instead of every week, so it's more sustainable. So I also have a sign-up sheet out there for Bible journaling interests. If people are interested in getting together a group, either online or in person, um, sign up out there so I can get a hold of you um, and we can get started on that. So yeah, that's all I have about Ohana groups. Uh, there are three different ways to give, to give our offering. We have the online, we have text to give, super convenient, but we also have the offering box back there. So um, I would like us now to just uh, bow our heads and hearts um, to pray over the offering, even though we're not passing anything uh, between each other. Lord, 
thank you for this opportunity to just worship together um, with others who love you, Lord, and just to listen to the word. And we just pray that as we give our time, talent, treasures to you, as we offer it up to you, that you bless us, Lord, and you you bless the work of our hands, and, and you bless um, our offering. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, now I have the opportunity to uh, introduce you guys once again to Pastor Calvin. Come on up. Oh, thank you. Just want to welcome you to Sunday service. Good to see all you faces in this sanctuary. And then um, want to welcome you, all of you online. Thank you for joining us. <clears throat> you know what is uh, amazing? Um, I'm, I wasn't asked to do this, but I'm just going to do it. You know, promoting Ohana groups, the value of Ohana groups. If you want to really grow in your faith, the place to do it is in Ohana groups. 20-something years ago, when we came back to the Lord, um, we were asked to be in an Ohana group. And, and it was really difficult because <clears throat> for me, you know, I grew up in church used to, to small groups. But for my wife, she wasn't really used to, to small groups, wasn't comfortable in uh, going to a small group. And so... <clears throat> You know, I was talking, oh, yeah, I would love to join it, but I don't think my wife would, would join it. So I didn't know how to a ask her. And so what, what happened was that friend that invited me, invited her. And to my surprise, she said yes. And I was like, praise the Lord. And I really uh, sincerely mean it. Without um, the Ohana group, we would have not grown and stayed in the faith as we have today. Today, it's really different. You know, the, my wife, I said, she didn't want to be there. She actually has about four different Ohana or life groups that she participates in. So she's actually way better than I am. Well, I just wanted to welcome you guys online and in those that um, are here. I wanted to encourage us more and more as you feel comfortable, as things are opening up <clears throat> to attend, come back to church. You know, one of the things ab about the difference between uh, worshiping at home and worshiping here is a big difference. The Lord says he inhabits the people, of, uh, he inhabits the praises of his people. And yes, you know, when you gather at home, two or three, he's in that midst. But here you get to worship with others. And one of the other things is you never know who's coming to church, right? And they may not worship in the same way that, that some of us do. Right, that's why I, I told the first, I sit in the front row because I sing loud and I sing off and I do crazy things do, doing service. So I sit in the front so I, I don't disturb anybody by my flat singing or loud singing. So, you know, but what I, what I notice about worship, it changes the heart. And it's funny, you know, when I first went to church, people were worshiping and they were raising their hands and I was like, I, I didn't grow up in a church that raised their hand, we're a conservative church. But all of a sudden, the tears began to drop in the service. And I, think, I thought to myself, what the heck is going on? You know, I didn't come here to cry. I came here to, to enjoy the service. Why I say that is because in his presence, right, for people, for a new person coming to the Lord, that presence will be tangibly felt. And so gathering of the body in worship is so important, just as well as the message. But I wanted to encourage you guys to that. Well. Today, my message is <clears throat> when times get tough. Hello, what a, what a crazy time for this message, but um, realistically, we've been going through tough times for almost two years, right, with this pandemic. It, it, it is not just affected you personally, right? It's not affected just your family. It's not just affected this church. It has not just affected this island. It's not just the state, it's not just the, you know, the United States, it's the whole world has been affected. And our lives have been turned upside down, and for a lot of people, times have been tough. I mean, just in, in relationships at home, in the beginning for many of us, right, it was the first time that husband and wife and kids and our family spent that many hours together. In the first two, three weeks, oh, it's, it, it's good, right, or for maybe some of this stuff we've never done, it's like, how am I going to do it? But it gets tough because the 24-7, day after day, right, and the, and the things that happen and the frustrations that go on, it, it gets tough. But today I wanted to, to talk about how can we raise a different generation? 
How can we raise a generation that not just lives in this world, but not get caught up living in the landscape of a consistently changing social, economical, political, scientific, and moral reality? What I wanted to talk about today is how we can pull lessons from people that have gone before us. Just like in, in the Ohana groups, there's people that have experienced things that we haven't experienced. Or maybe we have had experiences that they haven't had and we can begin to share. And we can begin to learn lessons from each other. But one of the greatest ways that I like to learn my lessons is really from the Bible. And it's amazing that so many of the best lessons to me are found in the Old Testament. Where we get to see people who are struggling, who are messing up, right? People that are in authority, people like David, people like Moses, all the different ones that we read about. And go like, wow, th their life is pretty messed up. But here, I wanted to talk about four people that we can learn lessons from. And his name is Daniel and his friends Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And how they had been living in the culture that was raised biblically. And now being carried off into Babylon, into a foreign culture whose worship is totally, totally different, whose values, whose principles, whose economic structure is so different than what they were raised in. So if you're talking about a shifting culture and a shifting generation, but they were forced to be trained and educated in it. But this is what the Bible says in Daniel 3, um, 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he, deliver, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. That we, um, but even if he does not, we want you to know your majesty that we will not serve your gods, nor worship the image of gold that you have set up. How amazing these um, four gentlemen, right? No matter what is going on in that culture, is not letting go of their faith. They're holding to the training, right? And the foundation that they grew up in. Train a child in the way that they should go and they will not depart from it. It is amazing the foundation that uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, along with Daniel, had. So that in times of difficulty, when they were asked and actually commanded to, because it was a commandment, to bow before these idols, they would not. Even if he does not deliver us, we will not bow to you. Isn't that amazing? They were willing to give their life whether God rescued them or not. How about you when times are tough? What if God didn't rescue you? Would you give up your faith? Would you say like, ah, God, nah, right, I, I've, I've done it all, I've tried it, it, it isn't working, ah, you know what? I'm, I'm just gonna follow the crowd. And it's so easy to follow the crowd when you're confronted in that way because of fear. And here, they were fearful, not of their own life. They were fearful that they were not going to honor God. So how can these lessons help us to live out our faith today? You know what is amazing? That the struggles that Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were going through are no different than the, than the social economical changes that we are seeing in our culture in the world today. And then we think, oh man, you know, the Bible is not relevant today. The Old Testament is not relevant. That happened thousands of years ago. And yet when I read this story, it's like, no, oh, I can relate to it because I see it happening right here in the midst of this island, in the midst of this world. And so what things kept their strong, kept their feet strong? What things or tools can we pull out from this lesson that would help us in life? One of the things that we could pull out was their faith. That no matter what the situation was, we saw them standing in their faith. 
what we saw was, was them in the middle of it still trusting God that he would defend them how many times did we feel that we get into a situation we get into a, a, a disagreement where we feel like I gotta defend myself I'm gonna fight for my rights I deserve it <clears throat> but here we find that these four are actually willing to give it up and we can learn from the Old Testament just as we can from the New Testament and in the book of Hebrews we see the hall of fame of faith where we find by faith Abel served by faith Enoch by faith Noah and by faith Moses and Abraham and there were a few others that by faith served God but this is what Hebrews says um, all these people who live by faith um, still live by their faith even when they died so they didn't give up on the Lord just because God wasn't meeting them where they were or giving them the desires that they wanted, right? No matter what happened, they kept on to their faith. In fact, they didn't receive, the Bible says, all of their promises in this lifetime, but they did. So how can that happen? See, even if I don't see all the things that God is doing in my life and answering all the things in my life, even when I pass away, is he still going to answer some of the prayers? Is he going to answer the prayers that I'm praying over my grandchildren? Are he going to, is he going to listen to the prayers that I'm praying over my children when I'm gone? Yes, he will. And the greatest thing is that even in eternity, I'll be able to see what God is doing. And here today, we see the promises of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob still lived out today. So we know that God is faithful we know that we can be, if we follow the right leaders, if we follow the right people, if we follow Jesus. So what are the foundations that you are building on? What are the things that you are allowing to build your character, to build your life? What are the pil pillars or what are the guardrails that you are setting, not just for your life, but to, for the children and for your grandchildren? What standards? What moral laws or, or what ideals or what values are you establishing for them? So we live in a world that is totally revolved around me. It's whatever I feel like, whatever I think, whatever I need, whatever I want to do, do it. And it's don't worry about other people. That's not their, uh, that's not your problem. That's theirs. Man, I used to live that life in the past where everything was about me. And I really didn't think that I was living a life that was all about me because of the good things that I was doing. And really the good things that I was doing was really masking also the bad things that I was doing. How many lived a dual life before Christ? I know I did. I lived one way with pe people and I lived one way at church. I didn't realize how incongruent my life until I started to read God's word and realize that life didn't really revolve on me. See, it wasn't about, I was raised to that success was everything. That you needed to be successful in whatever you did and you needed to be wealthy enough so that you could get the things that you want. How many were raised that way? And I was so driven that, that you needed to have this job and you needed to have this position and this is what they, they wanted out of my life. Very little was asked, what do you want to do with your life? So, you know, we can have all the things that we want. You can have the cars, you can have the house that you want, you can have the job that you want, but is it gonna be enough? You know, the last time I thought was about jealousy and about being satisfied. It is so easy not to be satisfied with the things that you have. How many can relate to that? I mean, just like if for me, going out to dinner, right? And I order a dish, and then I see on the next table, oh, wow, what are they eating? Oh, I wish I ordered that, or I wish I could have had that. Or you're on the same table, right? Or your wife, 
or, or, or your son or somebody else orders something else and it's like, oh man, all of a sudden the dish that you're eating is not that good because you're more concerned about what's on their plate and I wish I could have some of that. Anybody relate to that? But we don't just do it about meals, we don't do it about cars, we don't do it about house, houses, we do it in everything else in life. Nothing is good enough anymore. The marriage I have, the friends I have, the job that I have is not enough. What if I change my boyfriend? What if I change my girlfriend? What if I change my job? What if I, this apartment is too small, we need to get another one. My house is not big enough. I mean, we can add the list of what we don't have and what we wish we had. And we can pray about it and, and, and God may never answer us. And we're like, God, why I'm, I, aren't you ask, uh, answering what I'm asking for? And how many of you are ever glad that God doesn't answer all your prayers? I am. Because if, he's, if he did answer all my prayers, I'd be in big trouble. I probably wouldn't even be here today. right? Because one of the prayers, especially before knowing the Lord, I struggled in a marriage. And there were many, many times, you can't count it on your hands and feet, that I would say, I want a divorce. And I prayed, God, uh, I want another woman. I, I don't want this woman. I don't want to be in this marriage anymore. Can you imagine what would happen? I would not be here if he listened to my prayer. So I'm glad he didn't. See, but I wasn't able to endure the things that were going on in my life because I really didn't have a strong foundation. And the reason why I really didn't have a strong foundation is because in the way that I was raised, my mom and dad would constantly tell me how bad I was. That everything that I did, because they wanted me to do it better, I understand they wanted me to do better uh, now. I didn't understand it then. I thought they really thought that I was that dumb, they, they thought I was that stupid, I was that bad of a person, because that's what they kept on telling me. That how are you gonna get ahead if you don't do this and you don't do that? And so, this drive to become successful, this drive to want to be better, this, this drive right, to have more than what I wanted really became the struggle. And it became the thing that was running my life to become successful, to have the things. And then realizing that the more things that I had and the more that I fulfilled those desires, the worse my life began to, to get. The harder it was to to live through the struggles. Why? Um, because you run out of energy, you run out of time, right? And you get frustrated. You know, going from the apartment to the bigger house or going from the smaller house to the bigger house or, or getting yourself this when you can't afford it and, and, you, and, and you get that. Um, don't you realize I began to have to work longer, work harder, possibly find another job so that I could pay all the bills, right? So you start to do all these things and all of a sudden, right, the things that you wanted are actually the very things that you end up frustrated. And so what happens? You, you spend long hours or you, you concentrate on certain things and you get grumpy, right? You come home frustrated, you come home angry. And what happens? The very people that you love, the very people that you care for, are the ones that now you're hopping on, you're, you're, you're picking on them, you're arguing, you're frustrated. Is it so much so that, that these things will make us happy? Funny, we become slaves to it, and all of a sudden, right, the thing that you have is the thing that you can't afford or the thing that is taking you down. One of the things that, that I realize is the example we set is really important. Because there's a saying, right? Um, apples don't fall far from the tree or nuts don't fall far, too far from the tree, right? So that example you're setting is really important. You know, for, for me, I vowed that I would not raise my kids like my parents, right? Uh, I wouldn't discipline them the same way. I wouldn't expect the same thing, right? But you know, as I began to grow up and then friends used to come around or relatives used to come around and used to hear me talking to my kids, 
You know what they would tell me? I don't know if you ever heard it. Well, you sound just like your dad. You sound just like your mom. And well, all of a sudden, this frustration, right? The very person that I said I didn't want to be, I became. Nuts don't fall too far from the tree. Everything that I said, everything that I did, what example did I leave them? If family is important, then what are you placing as values? Are you more stressed out so that you cannot give them time? Or are you reducing the things so that you can spend with the time? I think one of the things that I re realized in, in COVID is right the stewardship of family and time. I've not seen more moms and dad walking with children than I ever did. I've, I've seen more time of, of dad spending actually at home instead of busy at work. But it's so easy now that things are changing that, okay, back to, okay, well, we gotta make a living, we gotta do this. I haven't done that for a long time, and so kids, you gotta wait, and all of a sudden, um, it becomes the same lifestyle that we were living. And so I wanna leave us with things that we can set it as foundation. So what are you gonna set as your foundation? See, what I realize is I don't have to defend myself. I don't have to make them feel guilty for the things that, that I'm struggling with. You know, when, I get in, when you get into an argument with your wife or you get into a thing with your kids, it is so easy, right, to defend yourself. And here you find, right, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, and Daniel, they're not arguing the case. They're not defending themselves. They're okay where they are because their foundation and their faith was solid enough so that at times when it was really difficult, they knew how to stand. And so I'm learning that I need to be consistent and I need to set my priorities in, in order so that I can live it consistently with what God's word says. Because the greatest struggle that, that we all have is living inconsistent lives. That we say things one way and tell people to do it one way and yet we do it another. I remember before coming back to the Lord, right? Um, I'd be drinking. And I would tell my kids, you shouldn't be drinking, right? And they said, oh, but dad, you drinking. And then they said, oh, yeah, dad, but you not only drink, right? You, you drink and you drive. And, right, you don't stop at two beers. You, you drink more. And I go, well, I'm your dad. And I'm responsible. So if I get into trouble, I'm able to take care of it. So you need to listen to me because I know what I'm saying. I'm responsible. If anything happens, I can take care of it. Isn't that kind of crazy? Yeah. Right? We tell them one thing and we live totally different and we expect them to follow. You know what is worse? Thinking that my drinking, the more that I drank, the smarter I got. No. The total opposite, the more you drink, the more foolish you get, or the more stupid things that you get yourself into. What I realize, right, and so this is what people used to say, well, you know, when I drink, I get to be me. I get to be happy, I, not, I don't have to be ashamed, I don't have to worry about what people think, right? No, you don't have to get drunk, or you don't have to feel good to become who God wants you to be. You know, just like I talked about praise and worship, why I sit in the front row is because I sing loud and, and I sing off. But see, I'm not ashamed anymore. I don't have to be afraid that, that I cannot sing, that, that I shouldn't sing. No, I'm going to sing with all my heart. Why? Because what I'm doing in worship is a foundation, right? That song, I offer this heart completely to you. In the midst of worship, what I'm saying is, God, can, can you take all the things that would cause this heart to become selfish, to become greedy, to think bad thoughts, to do bad things? Why I'm giving you my life today, why I'm offering my heart to you is because I got the rest of this week to go through. 
And if you're not working to change this heart of mine, then the world will, the circumstance will. And so basing our foundation on worship is one of the things that Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego did. If you look at any of our forefathers or any people of strong faith, worship and prayer is a foundation that we need to build. So how can we set our priorities for our children or for the generations to come if we are not setting our own priori priorities, standards, and values for ourselves? See, the stewardship of their lives and their time is important. And if we focus on that, it will not just transform and change their lives, it will also cause us to change the way that we live. So how do you spend your time? How do you spend your resources? And how you spend your money determines the foundation and standard that you set. And so if you don't value your time with family, then how would that be a foundation? If you do not steward your resources, how would that be a foundation? If everything is about money, then is that your foundation? And so we need to reset our, our foundations and our standards. We need to really refocus on what does God want from me? What is God's best for not just my life? What is the best for my daughter's life? What is the best for the people around me? What you begin to realize is that the first and second commandment becomes so important. To love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your strength, and all of your mind. And then the second commandment is then to love others. And the hardest thing to do is, is that learning to love others. Because when things get tough, it is so easy to, def to default to old patterns. To go back to the arguments, to go back to the same old way of dealing with issues and not really resolving. You know what I realized in my marriage? It wasn't the fights that made it bad. It was the unresolved fights that made it bad. That we weren't able to deal with the issues, we were not able to deal with anything because we didn't want to deal with our own selves. It was so easy to look at the fault in the other than look at your own. And what we've learned since coming to the Lord is to resolve our issues. And what we've found that every single battle that we've fought Every single obstacle that we have to go through as a couple has been our strength. That our marriage is that strong that it can, could have withstood the things that it went through. Had God listened to my prayer and, and, and allowed me to step out of it, I would not be here today. The strength of our marriage would not be the strength that others can draw on. Wow, if Pastor Cal and, and, and Pastor Marshall can go through that, and still survive and still love each other and still care for each other and it is visible to them then maybe I have hope maybe that God's word is true and it doesn't mean that we won't have struggles right there, there's things that the devil will test us but we have a foundation to build on because we've established that as a family and so my prayer to each and every one of us that we would establish a firm foundation. So what are you going to use to guide them? What are you going to use for yourself? God's word needs to be part of your life. God's word says, your word have I hidden in my heart that I may not sin against you. Can you allow God's word to be built up in you? like it was in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and the faith of our forefathers that no matter what happened, they never lost their trust in the Lord because they knew what he said to them. And so my hope is that we pull away from this, that our faith will constantly be challenged, but the challenge is so that we grow in our faith. That just like as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and Abraham, Isaac, and and Moses and Noah were all challenged in their faith. They stayed faithful. 
they knew that God would provide. See, it's so easy to come to church when you're in need. So that's what I did. At 16, I gave my, my life to the Lord. Right? And then I stayed in church for the next four years. And the reason why I stayed for only four years is because I got married at 20. I needed to get a job. I needed to provide for us as a couple, right? And so I started to work. And funny, um, because of all the bills, right, and because of the need to pay the bills, right, I had to work harder, work longer, right? The job that I had even entailed me to work on Sundays. And why I couldn't give up Sundays? Because Sundays was a really busy day um, for, for me. And so I gave up Sundays. Thinking that, okay, I'm gonna be a good Christian, I started to say, okay, Lord, I'm not gonna come Sunday, I'm gonna come on Wednesday. Because Wednesday had, had a night service, right? After a while, you get so caught up and you get so burnt out that church is the last thing, I, I, I just need to keep my head above water. And then things began to fall apart, right? And so I went back to church. And then things started to improve again. And then you get caught up again, back to, okay, things are good. And then, you, you know, I started to buy other things because it's going to make this family happier. It's going to make the kids better, right? And then end up in the same place. And you know what is difficult is because people would say, well, oh, you only go to church when things are bad. And I and kind of felt guilty for coming back, kind of wrestled with it. Maybe I shouldn't go back because that's a hypocrite, right? But, I, but something pressed me. And, I, I, and I'll share that. With, with us as believers. Um, you know when we say, oh, you know, people uh, outside in the world tell you, oh, you only come to, to the Lord when you're desperate or when you need something. Isn't that the best time to come? Right? Mom, mom, mom if, if you're a mom or, or a dad, right, and you have children, um, when your children are hurt or when your children are in a situation where they need help, I don't think we wish that they would go to somebody else. Don't you wish that they would come to you? I mean, we struggle with that even with our babies, right? So when, when our kids were young, right, and, you know, they got hurt, right, and, they, and they, they would start crying. You know the first person they generally cry? Mommy, mommy, and I would get jealous. I was like, how come you're not crying for daddy? Because daddy's there, right? But it would always be mommy. And I used to get jealous. And, and funny, I used to get frustrated. Well, how come the kids, you know, I do just as much for them. And then, boom, all of a sudden, we're fighting over the kids. We're fighting over who's more important. And, well, look at, look at the foundation. Built on wrong stuff. Built on wrong values. The goal is, is, is healthy, right? The goal is that they will love me. But is it okay? I have to protect and defend myself to make sure that, oh, I look like the good husband. I look like the good dad. So one of the things that I learned is that this walk with the Lord is for the rest of my life. You know, when I came back to the Lord and I watched, you know, in the older churches, right? You got people that came from the beginning of the church and they stayed till they, till they actually died. They, they died in the church. And this thing... Oh, those guys, are, how can they do it? And uh, They must be freaks or they must be crazy. I mean, to stay in church that long, oh, why would you stay in church? And then I realized they stayed because they had a firm foundation. That it wasn't one that was shifty, wasn't one that was determined by the world. Um, whatever other people were saying, they were there because they love God and they love people. And I realized for myself, wow, saw this totally wrong. It was just so that I could be a good Christian. No, I'm not here to be a good Christian. I'm here to be a lover of Jesus and a lover of people and be a light or an example for them. And so I want to leave you going over this last passage, which is found in 2 Kings 4, 1 through 7. And I use it as this is this woman's prayer. This is what this woman is asking of the Lord through the, uh, e the prophet Elijah. It says, the wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elijah, your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that he revered you. But now his creditor is coming to take my two, son, uh, my two boys as his slaves. 
And I just want to st stop to go over this passage, right? Here this woman is crying out. You talk about tough times. Probably bankrupt, don't have much money, right? Husband, it's gone. And now, right, they want to take my sons. And so this is her cry to Elijah, help me. In verse 2, Elijah replied to her, how can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? Your servant has nothing here at all, she said, except a little oil. Amazing, not only does she come to the Lord in prayer, right? She comes to the Lord with an honest heart. This is where I am. I, I, I have nothing else but a little oil. And, and she's also doing this. She's seeking wise counsel. She's coming to Elijah. You know, how many of us in a struggle stay by themselves, try to figure it out by themselves, think that I need to, even if I love God, I'm supposed to figure it out by myself? No, we're not called to do it by ourselves. Definitely we need him. But what I've learned in my walk with the Lord is I need wise counsel. I need people to speak into my life. I need people to help me. But one of the things that I need to do is be able to ask for it, be able to cry out. It would be so easy for this woman to live in shame and says, oh, I'm, you know, it is so bad for us that I can't even let people know that we're that broke, we're that desperate. But here she is crying out. And then this is what Elijah tells him in verse 3 now. Go around and ask your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask, don't ask for just a few. So what is she doing now? Asking neighbors. Ohana group is so important because you can ask in Ohana group. Asking friends at church, asking friends at work, right? And... This is one area when you ask and you're in need, why just ask for one? Why just ask for two? Why not ask for a few? Why not ask for more? A good friend would give you as much as what you need. So God is showing a principle, if you come to me, right, I'll give you more than what you need. And then we find in verse 4, then go inside, shut the door behind you and your sons. Pour oil into the jar, and as each, and as each is filled, put it to the side. So one of the things that I put out of this verse is you can have the right people in your life. You can pray. You can have the right people. You can be surrounded by the right friends. But what if you don't do what they tell you to do? So if this lady didn't close the door and didn't start to pour that out, nothing would have happened. And, and funny, just like us, right? We, we come to church. We can be involved in ministry, right? And we hear God's word. But when it comes to living it out, it's not really seen. And it's not really seen because when you go home, nobody sees what you're like at home. That's why a small group and being consistent in your small group is really important is because, you know, in those small groups, they actually begin to see how you really act <laughs> and what you really like. And then your, your wife or your spouse may get comfortable and says, well, you know, he pretends like he's like that at church, but you know, at home. And, and then, right? This is how we were then the arguments in the car going home. Why you said that? <laughs> Why you told them that? <laughs> you know, it's so embarrassing. But you know what? Uh, it's real. It's real. And, and my hope is that we can get not just real before the Lord, but we can get real before others. And then, right, with that wisdom, are, are we going to live it out? Because that's the important part, right? What are we living out? So this is what she did. After she left him, and afterwards shut the door behind her and her sons, they brought the jars to her, and she kept pouring. And when all the jars were filled, she said to her son, Bring me another. But he replied, There is 
not a jar left. Then the oil stopped flowing. Then she went and told the man of God, and he said, go sell the oil to pay your debts. You and your sons can live on the rest. It isn't amazing when she was obedient to God, when she was obedient to Elisha, when she set the example and shut the door before her sons, can you, can you see the correlations of the story? How when we become that right examples and we start the nut, don't fall too far from the tree. What do you think the sons are learning? And no matter how desperate our situation, mom went to wise counsel. Mom went to friends. Mom went to the Lord. And the friends cannot produce this oil. Only God can. And now they begin to see that this is a God that will provide for them. And you know what is amazing? That he doesn't provide just enough. Now, he didn't just provide enough for them to survive. He provided enough that they could pay their debts and then live on the rest. He can do abundantly, exceedingly above all we can hope for or all we can imagine. Is the Lord going to pay off your death when you've been extravagant? I don't think so. So if you think, you know, okay, yeah, I'm going to the Lord because, yeah, I got all of this. No. Why? Because he's asked us to be stewards. And if you have steward well and you ask him in tough times, don't you think that loving dad will hear your prayer and give you exactly what you need? And then so I go, amen. I'm glad dad Father God, that you didn't give me all that I prayed for, all that I demanded, all that I cried for, all that I screamed out for, right? Because you know best. And so in tough times, will you allow him to be everything for you? Will you allow him to help you and to teach you, and to show you just like he did with Shadrach, Meshach, and Daniel, and Daniel, those that went before us. In, in closing, you know, one of the things that gave them the strength is because they knew that God was their provider. They also knew that Jesus is their savior. And if you've never allowed Jesus to be your savior, he wants a relationship with you so that he can help you through your struggles, through the things that you are going through, through the tough times. And it's really easy, it's as simple as, Lord, I need help. I'm struggling, I'm frustrated, I'm disappointed. I'm not doing things right, things are not going right. So it sounds like, you know, um, I confess that I'm a sinner. But the reality is, this is what I'm living in. And so I'm telling you, this is where I'm from. That he hears that prayer. And what he wants to do is rescue you, to help you, to comfort you, to come alongside of you. But all you got to do is make that step and says, Lord, I need your help. I'm here. And will you? If you've been in, in church for a while, I think that you got to do it all on your own and you don't have enough strength, then that's why he's there. So that you can count on him, that you can ask him, just like this woman. And know that he's a good dad that wants to provide for you. And it will be a testing of your faith and trust in him. And so Lord, we just come to you with hearts high and unabandoned that we don't have to be ashamed of our past. We don't have to be ashamed of the things we've done and said, the people we've hurt, the hurt that we've going through, that we can actually come to you and give it to you. And you'll come to save us. You'll come to rescue us. You'll come to help us because that's what you are, that you're our savior. You'll save us from all the things but I pray that, Lord, that for those that have made you their Savior, that they would make you Lord. And that means 
I don't need to be in control. I don't want to be in control. I actually give you not just my life. I give you everything that I have and that I am. You take it, Lord. And then you teach me how to steward it so that I can build a firm foundation. And so, Father, we all give our lives to you. And we thank you for the work that you, you are doing and that you'll continue to do as we have stepped out in faith to say, I need you, can you help me, and I love you. In Jesus' name, and all God's people say, amen, amen. Well, before I close and before I dismiss us, one of the things that, that have, has kept me strong in my faith is this song. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand had provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. You know, one of the things that, that I know about God, that he is true to his faithfulness, and great is his faithfulness. And even though you're going through struggles, every morning, Ask him, Father, can I see new mercies so that I can be a merciful person? And then don't worry about what you ever need because his hand will already provide. And so as you leave today, I want to encourage you, no matter what is going on in your life, no matter how hard the struggle is, stay faithful because you can trust him and know that he will provide. Amen. Want to well, uh, say uh, have a good day for those of you online, for those of you here. Love on each other as you go and have a great day. See you back next week. <laughs>